What a blessed release it must be from the crowded, ill-ventilated workrooms in which so many have toiled through the long, hot, weary hours of the day. They have such a struggle. What can be done to make their life better? There is a time, a time to birth, a time for dying. A time to plant A time to pull up what is grown There is a time A time to join A time for breaking A time to build A time to cut down what has grown There is a A hundred years ago, a group of young Canadian women recognized that they faced challenges relating to employment, housing, and all aspects of society. They decided to try and do something about it together. Girls, girls, stop work for just a minute. There is a lady here who has asked permission to speak to you. Hello, my name is Bertha Wright, and I've been teaching Sunday school at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. I've thought about how you don't work on Sundays, and I'd like to invite you to a Bible class. It could be a lot of fun, just to be together. A kind of club, really. We're already working 14 hours a day, six days a week. Back to work now, girls. Back to work. Right, and I would like to invite you to a Bible class. Good. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. I opened a Sunday afternoon club for young women in a room borrowed from the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the first Canadian and U.S. national women's organizations, which, thanks to God, soon became a popular Bible class and study group. One day, the new minister from St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, Reverend Herridge, came to visit the Bible class. I will also give thee as a light to the Gentiles, that thou may be my salvation unto the end of this earth. I read this passage from Isaiah, and it made me want to start this Bible class. You know, ladies, this Bible class really is very wonderful, and I do want to thank you for inviting me here. But if I might be permitted to make a suggestion, I think that it might contribute to your devotion if you were to place this cross here. Reverend Herridge, there's no need for you to do that. I've been teaching Sunday school since I was a teenager, and we've never needed a cross before. Well, Miss Wright, I just think that it might help to make the class more meaningful more conscious of Jesus' sacrifice for you. Reverend Herridge, I really cannot agree. You are a guest here today, and as you can see, our faith is made real to us by our reading and studying the scriptures, and by our prayers and fellowship with each other. A brass cross is an idol icon. It simply does not add to what we already have. This is really interesting. <laughs> Miss Wright, I see that you're outspoken and opinionated. I shall be sending the bill for this cross to your father. I believe my father would not appreciate you contacting him about this. Reverend Herridge, 
if I may advise you. I think your energies would be better spent on more inspiring sermons, and perhaps you would do well not to read your prayer so quickly. I beg your pardon. I will be speaking to your father, young lady. Dear Auntie, you do not know how it troubles me, for I have always looked upon it as my highest privilege to meet with God's people around the communion table. And now where am I to go? Christ Church, St. John's, St. Albans? There is so much form and ceremony, and so little of the true spirit of worship about them. One cannot even join in the hymns. I, Bertha Hannah Wright Carr Harris, the heroine of Hull, was born of pioneering stock. I am the great-granddaughter of Philemon and Abigail Wright, the first settlers of the Ottawa Valley. Educated at Ottawa's Ladies College, started by J.M. Currier, my uncle by marriage, and my auntie, Mrs. Hannah Currier, I stayed for some years with them in their lovely home at 24 Sussex. J.M. Currier was the Member of Parliament for Ottawa, from 1867 to the early 1880s. 24 Sussex figured largely in the social life of the time, even though it was not then the Prime Minister's residence. We have some ladies here to speak to you. Let's pay attention and be on our best behavior this time. Hello. I am glad that we have an opportunity to meet today and get to know each other a little better. My name is Miss Wright. This is Miss Scott and Miss Livingston. Please have a seat. Perhaps I could read to you Psalm 23, it is very special to me. The Lord is my shepherd. Largely through the I influence of my aunt, Hannah Currier, I became interested in mission work, or as you might call it, Christian waters. social work. He I began to lead members of the Bible study to visit women in the jail on Sunday afternoons. And perhaps we could sing a hymn, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know. For Whatever progress Bible made in the prisons was undone so when the inmates returned to the prejudices of society. Popular views they were that such weak, friendless women were unreformable unfortunates yes, with whom Jesus proper young ladies me. should not interact. Yes, Wherever Jesus mission work was done, it should always be done yes, somewhere else. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. At the age of 24, in the face of such unsympathetic views, I established a home for friendless women, designed to offer shelter and employment to unfortunate women. We began with a definite evangelical focus. The Home for Friendless Women was successful and served the Ottawa community until 1940. We also started visiting patients in the Protestant hospital. And on Wednesday evenings, missions were begun in Lower Town to those who frequented the saloons and places of ill repute there. There were riots when I became involved in establishing a gospel mission in Hull, Quebec. Quebecois lumbermen were paid poverty wages and did not appreciate Protestant English-speaking ladies attempting to shut down saloons and inviting them to an evangelical faith. Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald himself a recent convert of Christian mission work, spoke in the parliamentary debates that followed. I have the privilege of knowing Miss Wright. I believe that she is a true Christian and anxious as far as her views go to spread the evangelical religion. I, for one, and all in this house, I am sure, will be only too glad to say that in her mission she should be unmolested and allowed to press her peculiar views on any audience she may address in this country. 
the honorable gentleman, instead of making speeches in this house, would have done better to have gone as an escort to Miss Wright. Earlier, I had recognized the need for assisting women whose character needed to be formed rather than reformed. The Honorable S.H. Blake, Vice Chancellor of the Ontario Government Chancery Court, agreed with me on this when he made his regular visits to check on the Home for Friendless Women's status as a government-sponsored charity. In 1885, after it became apparent that some members of our Bible class group were in need of suitable living accommodation, I rented a room in the Women's Christian Temperance Union at 98 Albert Street, which became known as the Young Women's Christian Institute. With 20 residents, the Institute quickly became self-sustaining and an important learning experience for what was about to happen. One day, the Honorable Samuel Hume Blake came into our house with former Toronto Mayor William Howland. They were both committed reformers and very involved in proactive approaches to charitable work. After discussing our common basis of faith, Mr. Blake said, What you have accomplished is quite commendable, but why don't you launch out now and have a building that's more worthy of the nation's capital? Well, that would take money. Well, I could, you could put me down for $500. Oh, well, well, thank you. What about you, Bill? Oh. Can you match that? Oh, I'd be glad to. Be glad. When they had gone, in my eagerness to communicate the good news to our Vice President, Mrs. Blackburn, I took the streetcar for New Edinburgh, where I met my good friend, Mr. T.C. Kiefer. When I told him what had happened, he added his name to the list for $500. I was intoxicated with joy when Mrs. Blackburn and later Mrs. H.F. Bronson added their names to the list for similar amounts. The language of the psalmist echoed in my heart. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his the first name. meeting of those interested in the formation of a young women's Christian association in this city was held in the YMCA last evening. As Honorable S. H. Blake and ex-Mayor Howland of Toronto were announced to deliver addresses on the movement, there was a large attendance. The object of this association shall be to promote the spiritual, intellectual, social, and physical welfare of young women. Twelve committees were appointed by our Ottawa Association to carry on various projects. In an incredibly short time, the fund reached $18,000 for an Ottawa YWCA building. A lot was purchased at Metcalf and Maria, later to become Laurier Avenue. The building committee set about discussing plans. An architect was then called in and the work was soon rushed to completion. The cornerstone of the new Ottawa YWCA building was laid by the Countess of Aberdeen, wife of Canada's Governor General. St. George's, Reverend J.M. Snowden, read the lesson. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed unto thy servants, saying, I will build thee a house. Therefore hath thy servant found him in his heart to pray this prayer. In! 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 The young men have had their innings. <laughs> now it's the young women's turn. If young men need such places of resort as the YMCA provides, then it stands to reason that young women not living in their own homes must need them to an even greater degree. Thanks are especially due to Miss Wright and her fellow workers for all they have done in the past with very inadequate means. Your Excellency, in presenting this trowel on behalf of the Board of Management of the YWCA as a small memento of this happy occasion, permit me to say that it is with peculiar pleasure that I do so. 
realizing the appropriateness of your excellency in laying the cornerstone of a building which is to be used to carry on a work to which so much of your excellency's time and interest has been given. The advancement in true happiness, health and usefulness of the daughters of our land. The work of this association is not performative, but of a formative character. Not intended to be the refuge for wrecks of love and hope, the needs of this class being fully met by other institutions. Nor is it, as some suppose, a religious club of old maids and blue stockings. <laughs> it is, as its name indicates. Rooms in the Ottawa YWCA rented for between $2.50 and $5 a week, including board. Women had to earn less than $4 per week to qualify for the cheapest rate. Owing to the large number of young women deprived of home privileges, a special effort is made to provide as near an approach as possible to a refined Christian home. Already, some of the Canadian associations, notably Ottawa and Toronto, have large and well-appointed buildings where the comforts of a good hotel and the privacy of a home are combined. According to popular notion, a lady may crochet the mat that a lamp is to stand on, but she may not clean the lamp. The line seems to have been drawn between work that is useful and work that is useless, the former being regarded as degrading, while the latter is considered quite in keeping with the position of a lady. Okay, class, let's keep kneading the dough. Bessie Livingston had begun teaching cooking at 98 Albert Street and was the first general secretary of the Ottawa YWCA. We sent her to the Boston School of Domestic Science and the Emerson School of Oratory. On her return, the Ottawa School of Cookery was opened and became famous throughout the province. By 1898, over 300 women were enrolled in the school. Almost half were training to be teachers of domestic science. From the beginning, the Ottawa YWCA established an employment office. By 1895, there were over 700 applications. Our Ottawa YWCA Physical Culture Committee introduced basketball in 1897. Phys Ed began as physical culture, with basketball in the lecture hall. The first Canadian Young Women's Christian Organization was founded in 1870 in St. John, New Brunswick. Other YWCA's followed. A time for laughing, a time to mourn, a time of dancing for the day. There is a time, a time to join. A time for breaking A time to gather stones The Columbian Exposition in Chicago, especially with its women's pavilion, designed by female architect Sophia Haydn, exerted an important stimulus to the life of women's organizations. Leader of the Canadian YWCA delegates at Chicago, Mrs. Adelaide Hoodless of Hamilton, described the first step in organizing Canadian work on a national basis. Upon my return, I wrote to every city and town across Canada. Where there were established associations, I asked for their views, etc. Where I did not know of any, I wrote to the mayor of the place, asking for information, and if he would kindly place the letter in the hands of some responsible Christian woman who would assist me in my efforts. In all, I sent 90 letters. Some are most courteously answered, and others ignored. The result was Adelaide Hoodless organized the first National Canadian Conference in the YWCA building, 18 Elm Street, Toronto. Unfortunately, Ms. Red of the Ottawa Association is unable to attend this meeting to give her address not by might nor by power. Bertha has often spoken of how the church does not as a body feel its obligation to a lost world as it should. It reclines in its comfortably fashioned pew and sings, Rescue the Perishing. But how seldom does it reach into the dark places? 
but too near the doors to rescue them. And so Twelve YWCA's were represented, including Ottawa. Although I was not present, I was elected Canada's first national YWCA president. The Constitution presented at the first annual meeting in Ottawa, January 23, 1895, stated the object of the new Dominion organization. ...shall be to unite in one central body all organizations existing, and those to be formed in the future for the purpose of the YWCA work, which is to promote the spiritual, intellectual, physical, and social well-being of all young women. It was an era when women were not legally persons. We could not vote or even own our own bank accounts. Records from five Eastern YWCA's, including Ottawa, show that reading, penmanship, French, English, elocution, dressmaking, millinery, shorthand, Bible study, cooking, and china painting were the most consistently offered and popular adult programs of the 1890s. I resigned my Ottawa position to become president of the National Council of the YWCA in Canada and later devoted all my time to work as traveling secretary, giving addresses in many Canadian cities. Newspaper accounts of these meetings indicate that my efforts were amply repaid in stimulating an ever-growing interest in YWCA work. Well, I think I would be... In 1896, I married Kingston's Royal Military College engineering professor, Robert Carr Harris, who already had six children and was 20 years my senior. I raised an additional six children of my own. This is my Bible, my most precious earthly possession. Even in the early 1940s, at the age of 80, I still led a Bible class for young women. I'd like to invite Miss Wright to come forward, please. So many things I remember about those exciting times. It is the unanimous opinion of the board that the untiring zeal and energy and the lofty aims and ideals of Miss Wright has been the means, to a great extent, of building up this association. And the faith is strong that work so well done will continue and prosper. And so began the Ottawa YWCA, paralleling developments elsewhere in Canada and throughout the world. Subtract we none. What God shapes under heaven is beginning and is done. What is has been already, what will be is here today. 